Right, this is the third time we're recording this, <laughs> just so you know. <laughs> Since he posted his first video 11 years ago, Mr. Who's the Boss, Aaron Maney, has gained over 16 million subscribers and a whopping 3.9 billion views across two YouTube channels. In this leaderboard episode, we take a peek into how Mr. Who's the Boss is building one of the biggest tech content channels in the world and we also discuss the future of tech, content and tech content. While you're here, don't forget to hit that subscribe button and the bell icon beside it so you'll be the first to know when we post videos like this. Alright, without further ado, let's get to the video. When people ask you what you do for a living, how do you, how do you describe it? Um, do you say you're a YouTuber or influencer? What exactly do you say? So it kind of, for me, depends on who's asking. Because there's certain people who you potentially don't want them to know you're a YouTuber. Because that, you know, they think, oh, he's got lots of money. Or I'd love to know where he lives and stuff like that. So if you're on an Uber on the way home, I normally say something that just does not require any further questions. You know, I make videos for a company, pretty much. Mm. Which is technically true. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, we make videos, so that's true. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But if it's like a, a company that I'm planning on working with, for example, I will describe myself as an influencer because it's a little broader and it captures the bigger scope of what we're trying to do now. Mm -hmm. um, I think YouTube is what it started with. But now, you know, when you're on TikTok and you're doing shorts and you've got Instagram, you're not really just a YouTuber at that point. True, true. But my loyalties lie with YouTube. If I had to pick one platform to stay with for the rest of my life, it would of course be that. Do you love your job? I do love my job. Um, I sometimes take it too far. Uh, <laughs> I sometimes get really caught up in videos and do not sleep as a result of it, but it's because I care. Yeah. And so I wouldn't have it any other way. Is that the same for you? Yeah, yeah, I, I same, I, I can say the same. And I noticed there's all those subtle details you add especially with like the animations and text and all those things. Um, why would you say that part was important? Because we love your animations. We love the details in the videos. What was the, why, why would you say it's, it's important for you to focus on those specific things in the videos? So there's two things I would say to that. One, high production value is good for retention. And retention is one of YouTube's key two metrics, right? Mm. The success of your video is click-through rate, and watch time. And so having lots of text, nice looking text, just keeps people watching. Um, my counterpoint to that though, is that I'm trying to focus a little bit less on blasting people with words on screen. Because as a, a storytelling metric, it's actually a little confusing sometimes. Sometimes there's so much going on on screen, you actually don't know where to look. Mm. And the videos I want to make are videos where there's one thing to look at at any one time and you're guiding people through this story that is your video. So I think in future, I'm going to actually tone it down, but make it really good text. Would you say you're a perfectionist at all? In, in I think you have to be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, to get that level of detail, I think you have to be a perfectionist in some way. But again, it's something that I think is potentially not helpful for your own kind of sanity sometimes. Hmm. I think when you're trying to create big budget shoots with lots of people involved, things aren't going to go sometimes the way you wanted them. Um, especially when you're doing collabs with other people, you can't predict what you want them to say. I've even sometimes tried to like pre-script what I think their answers will be to my questions, but it, it doesn't work it doesn't, like that. It doesn't always work that way. Yeah, I, I noticed for tech videos, because I, I also make tech videos, I noticed that um, it's kind of easier when you script it, you can anticipate the entire video. But for like lifestyle videos, videos that are unscripted, interviews, for instance, you cannot say what is going to happen in the end you can't even say what the length would be what the duration would be how interesting mm. you might find things as you're recording rather than before you record where you're scripting yeah but it's it's really hard like you say with tech to move away from that because the ceiling for what counts as good tech content is now so high and it's like if Thanks i just you. <laughs> <laughs> well, if i just sit and talk on camera like without knowing what i'm going to say it'll be rubbish yeah 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 true like true. you almost need to think about what's the plot here how are we keeping people um how am i making every little bit as interesting and different as possible how long does it take um from scripting uh, scripting editing you know post production how long does a typical video take tech video so longer and longer is what i'll say um I'd say an average video, probably a week and a half from start to finish. Um, but like, you know, you saw the Mr. Beast one that yes. we're working on. That video has been in the works for about four and a half. Four and a half weeks. weeks. A month. A month plus. 
actually. Yeah, a month plus. But yeah, th that video took us over a month because it's such a beastly video. There was like eight hours of A roll, and then that's like three separate days of B roll filming. Like, it's, it's so much involved. When specifically did did the YouTube channel take off? When did you know that this would be a real thing? That's a good question. I would say I had my first taste of success when I had my first viral video. So I posted it on a Friday, and by Saturday, Sunday, it was on like millions and millions of views at a time when the channel was getting like 2,000, 3,000. So that one completely changed my perception of what was possible and everyone around me's perception of what was possible. But then I also think there's a bit of a misconception, like viral videos don't make your channel successful. True. The, the main thing that video did was it changed my mindset. Well, did you say you went, to, you went on to produce more like videos or was it, did the video just help you refocus the strategy of your channel the temptation whenever you have a viral hit is to it's try to and cre cre create that viral yeah yeah exactly <laughs> yeah. you're like what was it that made that video work Do well let yeah. me let me replicate that exactly um so there were a couple of videos i tried after that with a similar theme but they didn't work mm -hmm. and looking back i can see why they didn't work but at the time it made no sense to me but then the first period of sustained growth of the channel happened when i started youtube full-time Okay. So throughout my entire career, I was doing YouTube alongside studies, okay. university. But then the moment I quit and I could dedicate my entire life to just this one thing, that's when I started noticing every single day I was getting more and more subscribers. It was like a snowball. We've had all of that. And now you are like among the most subscribed channels in the world and the most subscribed tech channel in, in the UK. How do you sleep at night knowing that? Yeah. <laughs> like, how, how do you feel about, about that? First of all, like, it's kind of crazy to hear you say that like it's such a big deal because I think are you the biggest tech channel in Nigeria? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I mean I, I don't I don't really think about it that much. Well it's exactly. Not, it's it's not... one of those things. It's kind of like, yes, we have these small localities and technically we're yeah, the biggest. Yeah. But YouTube is a global thing. It's a global Most yeah. of my audience is actually American. True. Thirty percent um, of my audience is Nigerian. Thirty. Yeah. Okay, so it's not really a lot. Um mm. do you know my percentage is about ten percent UK? <laughs> yeah but it's the nature of like it's such okay. a tiny little island right yeah yeah um hmm. that's a very hmm you see it's, it's actually it's weird it's like oh it might seem one way on the surface but when you look inside it's, it's very different yeah uh, the way youtube works is when you start a channel by default you're getting served to people in your area but the bigger you grow, the more YouTube figures out exactly who wants to watch your content, yeah, yeah. regardless of location. Mm. And so it tends to become the average of where the most populated areas are in the world. So I, I remember when you when you initially started, there was a period where you were uploading videos like every single day. Mm. What's changed? Like how, how what, was it like burnout or how, how did you like... She kind of, kind of burnout. Um, so what it was is, you know, this period after university where I was going all in on the channel, that's when I told myself, this is your one chance to make it work. Make a video every single day or else. Do you know what I mean? I was setting myself this kind of ultimatum. True. And I did it for like six months and it was incredibly satisfying in one sense because every day I'd wake up and I'd be like, oh, let me check my stats. And I would see progress. But it got to a point where I was so mentally tired there was one filming session on like a really hot day where I was on my own for a long period of time. And I remember I just broke down crying on camera. Um, I never actually like posted that video, but wow. it was this realization of like, I am actually in pain right now. This is really, really tough. Um, and that then forced me to take a couple of days break and really start to think about working smart as opposed to hard. So that's when I started looking at retention. That's when I started looking at engagement and not just kind of blasting the internet with as much tech content as possible. I know you did something about the, there's a video you made about fitness and I think mental health feels, hmm. uh, you wanted to change things. And uh, it was, it was very interesting because my editor and I were also going through the same thing. Ah. Yeah. And that video was just like a wake up call for me as well. How is the progress like for you now? Good. Uh, I'm very, very like excited to like show people. I've got about a month left of it while we're talking, um, which is also means a bit of pressure because I've almost <laughs> got to make sure I show people that there is an obvious difference. Progress. Um, but yeah, I'm sticking to it. Like, you know, got my water. Okay. I've reduced my caffeine. I'm eating much healthier, much lower carbs. And I stand almost all day on my standing desk, which actually after a period of time does start to feel like a bit of a workout. And I guess maybe you could say that it kind of feels like a break when you start sitting, even if you're working, because your body feels relaxed. 
So I can sometimes feel like I'm treating myself by working sitting down, which is kind of crazy. So in terms of YouTube now, do you have every single day like scheduled, planned out, or do you... I know tech is very dynamic sometimes. Mm. Something can happen. You might need to travel somewhere. Yeah. But I, would you say for the most part, your days are planned out or you just take it as it comes? This is a hard one because I wish my days were more planned out. Okay. Um, I, I'm starting to grow the team now. And when you have a larger team, you almost need some sort of schedule so yeah. that they can wake up in the morning, know what they're doing. Otherwise, it's just a mess and everyone's unproductive. So I'm trying to create structure. And the way I've created structure is by using filler content. Okay. So, you know, you have these kind of unpredictable tech events that just come up. Yeah. yeah. You allow yourself some headroom to be able to suddenly switch tact and focus on those things. But you have these background videos that are not as timely that everyone can just kind of work on in a normal schedule. There was something I actually wanted to show you. Um, We had a bit of a... We watched a video of yours, my Mm. editor and I, and... I don't know if I, I'll probably cut it off camera, but we had a bit of an issue with it. Um, yeah. I actually wanted you to see it. It's- you got me. You got me good. <laughs> no, that's fair enough. I deserve that. <laughs> What's your daily driver right now? (laughs) (laughs) Right. So my my daily driver is an iPhone 13 Pro Max with the D-brand something grip case. This one. Yes, this one. Um, I switched to iPhone around the iPhone 11 Pro Max when the S20 Ultra was the phone I was using. And the reason for that was a couple of little things in my life. It's about the time where I started dating my current girlfriend and we were voice noting a lot. Okay. And I noticed that her voice notes to me sounded amazing. My voice notes to her sounded like trash. And then the second thing was Instagram stories. So around this time, I was doing a branded campaign with a company um, for which I had to post some Instagram stories. And I couldn't, for the life of me, get these Instagram stories to look as good as I wanted them mm. to. Like good enough that I thought, okay, this is good enough for a story. And it was partly just the fact that Android phones are not well optimized with third party applications. Yeah. I read somewhere that uh, I think for for a while, Snapchat was using the screen recording of Android phones. Yeah. And then they were using cameras directly for the iPhones. So, yeah. Yeah. So basically camera quality, the audio quality of voice notes. It's kind and of... And a couple of other things. It's more the integration the within apps, apps, to be honest. Because I don't think Android cameras are worse than iPhone cameras no, specifically. No. It, when it comes to video, yes. Yeah. But then I prefer <laughs> them when it comes to photos. So it's more just the software. Mm. Um, and I use a Mac as well. So there are some useful things like AirDrop, for example, that actually saves me time. What's your like most useful app and you can only pick one? I would say Headspace right now. Um, Headspace. Have you heard of it? I feel like you've mentioned it in a video. Yeah, it's a meditation app. Ah, okay. And because uh, as part of this challenge to myself, I'm also focusing on meditating every single day for at least 10 minutes. And I've actually used this in my day-to-day life. Um, Like there've been times where I've been really worked up because I'm like, oh my God, this video isn't going to plan or sudden schedule thing has come up and I'm like, oh, this is right when I was going to take a holiday. But then I've been able to kind of take a step out, look inside of myself and recognize the emotion I'm feeling and being able to separate myself from it. So you can almost like catch it before it takes over your entire body. So in terms of smartphones, if someone calls you up and says, hey, Aaron, I I need a smartphone for... $500. $500. What phone would you recommend? Or £500 maybe? This is a really hard question because I think we both know the answer actually depends on who's asking. Okay. So, so my recommendation tends to be split into two main camps. For the people who are really tech savvy okay, and for the people who don't care as much and just want something that works. And it tends to be the case that if you're really tech savvy, I will recommend you a Poco or a Realme or some really, really kind of like lots of tech crammed into one device kind of offering. If you're someone who doesn't care as much, I would tend to recommend more like a a Google Pixel or now the Nothing Phone One, because those are the devices that are a little less focused on specs and a little more focused on the experience. Mm. And you pay a little more for that experience, which means that if you're more tech savvy, you don't need it. But if you're less tech savvy, it might give you a little bit of cushioning. My rough kind of like chain of reasoning is what is your current phone? Are you happy? In which case, let's use the current version of the same brand 
as a kind of base. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you've got a Samsung Galaxy S9 and you're happy, what about the S22? Does that fit your current criteria? Um, Because really, like, of the top smartphone brands now, there aren't really any bad ones. Do you know what I mean? Like, the bad ones get filtered out very, very quickly. quickly. It's just a case of, like, am I familiar with the software? Do I like the way the photos, kind of the style of the photos... That kind of stuff. Speaking of like the, the phones to choose, uh, you and Marquez made a video, the iPhone versus Android, mm. and it got quite a lot of interesting <laughs> reactions. Uh, what what was the reasoning behind that video and what have you like picked up from that video since? The reasoning behind the video was there's never been a better time or place to do this video and never a better person to do it with. Mm-hmm. You know, it was just after Google had had I.O., just after Apple had had their developer conference. Oh. So it's kind of like we currently have all the latest features in front of us and we are, you know, two people who are known to talk about Android and iPhones a lot. Yeah. Yeah, let's do so, this. So that was it. We kind of anticipated there would be some some pushback, yeah. but we didn't want to let that affect the conversation. True, true. I mean, it's a, it's a very it's a very interesting conversation that always gets reactions everywhere, Twitter, yeah. Facebook, everywhere you you know, I, iPhones versus Android, and there's always this bucket that tends to think that Android people are poor or something. Yeah, and, and yeah, it's just so weird. But Which is definitely not the case anymore because top end Android phones are more expensive. Than I Android. mean, like the S twenty two Ultra is a very good phone. I I use that as well as the iPhone, but. Yeah, it's, it's weird for people to just classify people into one bucket. I think a lot of it is like people like to feel good about the choice they've choice made. They've made. Mm, true. So you find on a lot of tech reviews, especially if you bash something, the people who've actually decided to get it feel personally insulted. Do you think smartphone tech has has peaked? I, I wouldn't say a peak. Um, I would say a temporary plateau. Mm. Um, it kind of like the smartphone market right now feels a little bit like the phone market before the first smartphone. Okay. You know, kind of like everyone was making lots of different variations of phones with keyboards kind of thing. Um, and we're just waiting for that next step change, which might be augmented reality, might be virtual reality. We're not too sure what it's going to represent right now. But I think the reason it's taking so long is that as tech becomes more complex, naturally the time gap between the new tech advancements is going to be greater. The leap needs to be bigger, bigger. for it to be able to pull us away from our smartphones because they're already so good. If anyone, if a brand reached out to you and say, you know, Mr. the Boss, can you design a phone or can you like, you know, just come up with a smartphone design? Would you would you take that offer up and what, what would it be? I would love that. Um, yeah, it depends how much freedom I was allowed. If it's kind of like you get to pick the color, I'd probably be like, no, I'm not putting my name on that. Mm. But if it's, you can come up with the whole thing, you can choose the material, the texture, like every part of this phone's design, then I'm interested. Um, and so I would, what would it be? The Vivo uh, X70 yeah. Pro. I think there was one you mentioned had the best camera um, um, outline. Uh, is, it, is it outline or? Xiaomi. Xiaomi, yes. That's yeah, actually, yeah. It would actually be pretty close to that phone. I think that phone does so many things right. Do you agree? It looks like an actual camera on a phone. Yeah, exactly. And the texture is nice too. Do you see what I mean? It does look very good. So this is what you would pick in terms of a smartphone design. It would be very close Close to to this. Um, What do you think of TikTok? I am slightly scared by TikTok, to be honest. I'm slightly scared at how ruthless it is. Sentiments shared. Yeah. (laughs) How how ruthless it is with watch time. and how ruthless it is with attention spans. Like sometimes, you know, I'll be on a train and I'm sitting next to someone who's using TikTok and for for 30 minutes, it almost feels like they're dead. Yeah. (laughs) Like they're like a machine and they're kind of going like this. And I think in these moments, they're actually not aware at all of what's happening because it's so stimulating. It can just absorb you and then you can appear on the other end after like 45 minutes or whatever. But nonetheless, like we have to adapt. I think this is the one thing with content creators, like if we don't adapt to that, we will be left behind. But the scary thing is that TikTok has set a new precedent that the world is trying to catch up with. So yeah, I absolutely think it's here to stay. I think long form will coexist. Will coexist. I I can't see a world where that doesn't exist too. Mm. But it feels like content is being moved to both extremes almost. Yeah, so it wouldn't displace long form content in your opinion. I think it can potentially, I think it might eat into long form content. I think a lot of the people who previously watch podcasts may well start shifting to lots and lots of just short clips. Mm-hmm. 
but there's always room for like, you're not going to get a review in a 30 second clip, no, right? No. If someone wants to know how good the next iPhone is, they're not going to find out on TikTok. Mm. Um, the last question is not really a serious question, but who do you think I should interview next? Mr. Beast. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. We, we, we would make that happen. <laughs> we'll see about that. Send send him an email. Yeah. So uh, you heard it here. He said I should interview Mr. Beast. So thank you so much for your time again. And to check out the last video where we interviewed a company that processes, believe it or not, seven billion dollars every month. A Nigerian company. Uh, just click here. Click on click on me. Yeah. <laughs> and 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 we'll see you in the next one. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Thank you. This was nice.